so this lecture, the general topic is the singular value decomposition and every matrix, rectangular or not, singular or not, has this factorization. So the fact that it works for every matrix is uh, quite, uh, makes it useful uh, all around. And this, these factors, there's an orthogonal matrix, there's an orthogonal matrix, and in between is a diagonal and rectangular matrix. So that this is rectangular and that's the same shape. These are square orthogonal matrices. They're the same thing we called Q, but now we've got two of them, so they get called U and V. Okay, uh, I, I want to, that's the main theme of the lecture, but there are a couple of things that are simpler and clear that we could just do first. Uh, one is a little bit, um, uh, coming from the last lecture. So this is, so this is, this is a, a question. Suppose I have a, suppose I have two matrices A and B. And suppose that when I do this crucial operation of A transpose A and B transpose B, I get the same matrix. I would like to know, okay, what does that tell me about A and B? And I bet we can guess the answer. We won't attempt to uh, prove that it's always so, but, but tell me how a, a connection between A and B that would produce that result. Oh, let's see. Same, I, well, yeah, we're going to have to know, yeah, if we, only, if we knew, it's tricky. It's tricky. If we only know eigenvalues, we know a lot of stuff, but not everything. Um, suppose, yeah. I, I, any other thoughts? Any thoughts about when uh, this might be the same as this? Well, they could be negatives of each other. Okay. Now we want to, could, are there more cases? Well, here, here's a case to think about. Suppose, um, Suppose A is the identity matrix. Then the left side will be I. And what could the right-hand side be? Any orthogonal matrix. So we're beginning to get a sense of, hey, there are a bunch of solutions, uh, but that was a special case, of course, when A was the identity. Then we, we, we could have any orthogonal matrix as B. So somehow, why is that? It's because when we do this B transpose B, the, the orthogonal, orthogonal bit cancels itself and we lose it. Now, now do you want to make a guess on the general case? Yeah, if, so the answer is then, then somehow uh, A is some orthogonal matrix times B for some Q, for some Q, then for some Q. Do you see that that, let's see, first of all, is that right? Did I get it right? If this is, I really mean it to be uh, if and only if in math, in math language, that the equation like that is true if A and B are connected by an orthogonal matrix Q. And would it, A transpose A then, because then we will, well, this isn't the proof, then A transpose A will be uh, QB transpose, so that's B transpose, Q transpose, times A is QB, right? A transpose is that, A is that, and then it, it works, right? Everybody sees Q transpose Q, canceling in the middle, leaving B transpose B. So that if, I mean, this is typical of a math question, very, very typical of theorems in mathematics, that you have some question, and here is one, one way that could produce that. And we just checked that it did. But now what, there's always the other part of the theorem that's the hard part, is that 
is that if we've shown that if this is true, then this is true because the Q cancels. But now it's the other way. If this is true, how do you get down to this? And actually, the SVD is a is a key in in being able to do it. But uh, that, I thought you might just like that. Uh, it's a paper I just uh, saw, in fact. Uh, uh, the title of the paper was something like, when is A transpose A equal B transpose B, and why do we want to know? Uh, and uh, so uh, we've just answered the first part, when, and why do we want to know? Well, it's, uh, it's all in this stuff of this afternoon's lecture. I'll just mention where the paper is. It's in the American Math monthly, I, I don't know if that's in the lab's library or not, uh, 96. Okay, that's, that's just for, well, not just for fun, I was going to say just for fun, but it's because it's actually uh, significant. Okay, now another topic, change of topic, but again, it's one that I, I'm going to get to norms of matrices and condition numbers without starting on the SVD without getting those, those, uh, all those factors in. So we know how to measure, we know one way to measure, a good way to measure, the length of a vector. That's, that's Euclidean length that we spoke about, sum of the squares, square root. How do you measure the size of a matrix? How shall I measure the size of a matrix? Because it's natural to want to do that, to say this matrix, the word norm is somehow used rather than length. Well, I might, I might say length of a vector, I usually do. I could say norm, this is the same as length. Here, somehow, length isn't quite the right word, but how shall we measure the size of a matrix? Then we could know if it's getting small or getting large or what, it, what it's doing. Uh, how did, uh, there isn't any single answer to this. Yeah? I mean, if you, for instance, thought of it as a vector and, and square. Exactly. You do that, but you'd lose a lot of information. Well, but that's, that's, that's one way that's certainly done. So, so one way is, uh, uh, is that way exactly. Think of the vector as n squared, it's got n squared entries, uh, uh, the matrix, sorry, as having n squared entries. And just take the sum of this. So this is called the Frobenius norm. I'll put F there and, and write his name out in full, Frobenius. This is the, the Frobenius measure then is this, I take the sum of all the Aij squareds over I and over J. In other words, the sum of squares of all the entries and then take the square root. That's a, that's a perfectly reasonable way to measure. That, that sort of measures the size of the matrix, but as you're saying, it, it somehow loses some aspect of the matrix, because uh, what do matrices do? They multiply. They multiply vectors to give other vectors. They transform things, and that's lost in this. This is just like um, a length, but it's uh, an important one. Now, if I think about that other aspect of matrices, of matrices as being things that, ma that multiply vectors to give other vectors, then what would be another way? Uh, so I'm looking now for a second possibility, and this was a good one, of length. Yeah. Well, determinant. Now, determinant is... Uh, you, it's a natural to think of, but it's not a very happy number. Um, why not? Could be negative, so we would take absolute value at the very least. But it, here, here's the kind of property that we would love to have and that we don't have. For example, the length of a vector has this wonderful property that the length of x plus y how is that related to the le separate lengths of x and of y? There's a, there's a less than or equal that. And wh what's that 
do you know the name for that fact about lengths of vectors? No, it's, clo it, it's I could get Schwartz from it, but it had, it, it's the triangle inequality because it, all it's saying is that if I have a, a triangle with a side of length x and another side of length y, then the third side, the length of the third side can't be longer than that plus that, right? Here's the third side, x plus y or x minus y, something y minus x doesn't matter. So the, the, so this is really saying that the third side of a triangle can't be longer than the first two sides. And of course, when could it get, when does it even get close? Well, if x is, is this way and y is pretty darn near, then x plus y is almost the sum of the lengths. And we could only get equality. When could we get equality in this? Well, they'd have to be you're absolutely in the same direction, right. So we would like, that to be true for our matrix, we would like to keep that property for our, for our matrix norm. We, we would like to know that if we add a couple of matrices, so this is something we want, we would not, you know. And that property would be true, all right, for this uh, Frobenius guy. Because, why is that? Because it's, it's, it's just, we're just taking this matrix and stretching it to a long vector. So it's, so if for Frobenius, it's the same as the triangle inequality for this n squared length vector. Now, sorry? We could look what A does to a vector. I was going to say about determinants. One, I just, just before I, I want to kill off determinants. Uh, uh, in the sense that the determinant of A plus B, like we, could be sort of almost anything. Yeah, so, okay. So let me follow your thought and, and now tell me more. How do I look at what A does to a vector? Well, that's another vector. Yeah, I get another vector. It has a norm. Which has a norm. That's right. So we're going to create a norm of a matrix out of that decision on, so how shall we do it? We take a vector x, and we know its length, and what do we do? We, we multiply by a, and we know the length of this. So I know the length of this, and I know the length of the original x. So what shall I do to come up with a size of a, so to speak? Divide. If I divide by this, if I, if I look at this, let me, so those, these are both vectors, so we know what lengths of vectors are. So, so I take any vector x, I, I multiply it by a, and I look to see, okay, did it grow? And this ratio will be the growth ratio, right? Right? I, I could normalize to say, well, I'll take unit vectors. Then I wouldn't have to divide by the one, but either way, doesn't, doesn't matter. Often you see it one way, often the other. Now. Okay, but now what's up here? Better maximize I better maximize. I'm looking for the worst x, right? Because some vectors x might get, might be in the null space. They might go to zero. But that doesn't mean the matrix is the zero matrix. So the, a good norm then is the max over all non-zero vectors x. So the, the max of this. And, and, and as I say, I could take the max, I could take it over, I could make the denominators one, and then I would just be looking at the numerators. So the question is, how much can the matrix blow up? How much can it increase the size of a vector? That's, that's a good measure of the norm. Now does, well, okay, I guess we ought to check this property, but it, it's, it's easy. This property will come right out of the vector property. And actually, another property will come out for the matrix norm, that the norm of A times B is less than the norm of A times the norm of B. I can sort of say it in words why that'll be true. Because what's the norm of AB? By, by, my, by my idea here. I take vectors x, I see how much they're blown up by a, b. Okay, 
Well, first of all, I could look at that in two steps. I could say, okay, I take that vector x. How much is it blown up by b? And then how much is bx blown up by the a, right? And, well, why, so why don't I have just equality there? I get two shots, yeah, I get two shots on the right. The, the worst x, the x that gets blown up the most by b, might not produce a bx that, that a was, was strong on. So, so uh, yeah, so, uh, in, in other words, it, it, this just comes from, here's the proof, that the length of abx is less than or equal, well, a can't blow bx, that's how much a can blow it up by, and now I'm down to here, and that's, I'll just repeat the A, and Bx, can't, B can't blow X up by more than its norm. So, now I've learned that this, that this ABx can't blow up more than that. Okay. So that's, this is a, a, a very, sad, this is like called the uh, sometimes called the operator norm because I'm thinking of A as an operator, as acting, whereas this is more the array norm, Frobenius, but it's got uses uh, just like so. So those are two important norms. I, I, I guess I should admit that we could measure the length of vectors other ways, and if we did, this would give us another measurement of A. How else could I measure the norm of a of a vector x, uh, the length of a vector x? Just just let's I won't even write it down, but let's just think of other ways that we could measure the size of a vector. Change two to p. Yeah, change, some of absolute values. Yeah, right. Just just I, I need to take absolute values because I don't want any any norms to go negative. That's an absolute rule. Never let them go negative. So I could take the sum of absolute values. But here I'm taking the sum of absolute values squared and square rooting. Uh, oh, I could take the largest absolute value. Just just look for the component that's the biggest. Those are all, and then there's in between piece powers. But this this one is the this is like the two norm because I'm taking squares and it's it's uh, uh, very uh, convenient. It gives you a nice geometry because it's just the geometry of ordinary space. I mean, the length of a vector is what, when I draw it, uh, it's you know it's what you it's about four inches, right? Okay. So so there's lengths. Now we have an idea of the size of a matrix. Okay, where to go with that? Well, this question of conditioning is what I wanted to follow up on. Okay. So now now let's introduce. These are basic ideas. What's the norm of a matrix? And it's, oh, but I better, before we get the condition number, uh, how would I find that n number? What's the worst x? Huh, that's not, uh, maybe so, we've got to think about that a minute. But it's, yeah, this is ideal linear algebra to think about. Uh, what it, Right? You left me with a maximization, but now you've got to tell me how to do it. Uh, um, what x, if I have a matrix A, suppose I know its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. What could you tell me about the norm? Suppose, uh, see, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I have to look at ve vectors x, so I'm looking for which vectors are blown up a lot. Well, one that's certainly a candidate is right. That top eigenvector, that, that that the one with the biggest eigenvalue, is certainly a candidate because it's blown up by how much? By that factor lambda. So the norm is certainly as big as as lambda max. So, so let me just. Put, put this conclusion down. The norm of A is at least lambda max, the, the, the size of the biggest eigenvalue, because, because everybody sees that we'll get this if we take x to be its eigenvector. Now the question is, 
could there be some vectors that, like aren't eigenvectors, that still get blown up even more? Let me take an example to show that that could happen. So suppose I take the matrix 1, 1, 0, and 10. What are the eigenvalues of that matrix? 1 and 1. Because it's, tr it's, it's triangular, so the eigenvalues are 1 and 1. It's repeated. But that matrix, there's some vector that's going to blow up by more than 1 with that matrix, right? What is, uh, so tell me a vector that will blow up quite a bit. Zero, one. If I multiply, if, if, if I say, okay, take that unit vector and look at AX, it gives me, what does that multiplication give me? 10, 1? So what have I learned out of that little calculation about the norm of this matrix? Here's a unit vector. It got thrown into this. So what have I learned about the norm? In this case, the norm of A for this example is at least is at least 10. Actually, we can push it even a little higher than 10. Square root 101 if we wanted to really, because we've got we've got a vector that, that big. See, that's our AX here. And we put in a unit vector. Now I don't know if that's the worst vector. But we at least we've got at least square root of 101. So what are we what are we seeing here? We're seeing that if the matrix is kind of unsymmetric, as this one strongly is, then the eigenvalues and eigenvectors don't give the whole story. And actually, maybe that's a very important thing to uh, learn in general. That if a matrix, the, the more unsymmetric, non-normal the matrix is, the less the eigenvectors and eigenvalues are, are a total picture of what it's doing. Because the eigen, well, actually that only has one eigenvector, but I could give it an, I could change this to one point, change this to 1.1 1 .1 or something, and then the eigenvalues would be 1 and 1.1. 1 .1. But there's a vector that's getting blown up by a lot more. Yeah. So the eigenvectors of unsymmetric matrices are, for, for symmetric, so here, what do I want to, uh, let me c continue here. Suppose A, let me take two important cases. Case one, when A is an orthogonal matrix. A is Q. What's its norm? One. Everybody agree with that? The norm is one? Because if A is a Q, QX has the same length as X. No change of length. So, fine, the norm is 1. Second important case if, is, if A is if A is symmetric. Now, for, uh, let me say what the deal is here. For a symmetric matrix, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors do give a reliable thing. The norm is the largest eigenvalue. But now any A, we're still wondering what's the norm. If I take any matrix A, and like this one, let me let me put let me make that a one again to make it nice. What may what vector is being I don't know if I can figure the norm of this, but uh, it's a little more, I think, than square root of 101, I think. I'm pretty sure it's a little more than square root of 101, but it's, we're, it's darn close. Because you certainly picked off right away the, the, the vector x that was getting blown up quite seriously. Um, hmm. how, to, how to do this? Yeah, so can I... Can I tackle this idea of for any A, how, 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 so it's the, eigen, so again then, the eigenvectors are not giving us the full story. Now, let me tackle this thing. Um, 
Can I square it? You don't mind if I square stuff. Norm squared, just because it's easier to have things squared. Okay, so now, now let me say what is what is the norm squared of AX? Uh, 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 this isn't going to be long, but uh, you'll see it. What's the norm squared of a AX? It's the inner product of AX with itself. And of course, when I see that, what am I going to do? I'm going to break it out into X transpose, A transpose, AX. No problem, right? I'm just doing manipulation. I'm still asking the question, what makes this big? And maybe you can guess the answer now that I've written it this way. What vector X is the guiltiest? The, the one that gets blown up the most in this uh, in, the, in this in this thing. You could, you could take a shot at it anyway. It's going to be an eigenvector of of a transpose a. Good old a transpose a has shown up again. It's the eigenvector. It's the top eigenvector of a transpose a. So let's call its top eigenvector. Uh, um, and that's positive definite, so we know it's positive. The top eigen, so I'm going to call the top eigenvalue, the top eigenvalue I'm, uh, uh, of this thing, I'm going to call is, I'm going to, I can't, I've used lambda for the eigenvalues of A, but now the eigenvalues of A transpose A, those are different numbers normally. Normally different numbers. And I need a different letter, and it's sigma. And, and actually sigma, so sigma max. And I mean, you're going to use sigma for the square roots of the eigenvalues of A transpose A, so that, so that sigma and lambda are comparable. So, so the largest, the top eigenvalue of A transpose A I'm going to call is called, or written, sigma max squared. OK. And that's, for any A, the norm is this guy, sigma max. Can I, can I uh, reduce it to, uh, can I just see that this, that, this, that this result is consistent with these? Suppose A is symmetric. Suppose A is a symmetric matrix. Then this reasoning is still correct, but what is A transpose A if A is a symmetric matrix? It's just A squared. Right. If A transpose is the same as A, then all I did was square A. And what are the eigenvalues of A squared? They're the lambda squareds. So then I took the largest lambda squared, and then I took its square root, and I got the largest lambda. So in the symmetric case, this the sigmas are the lambda squareds. The sigmas, sorry, the sigmas are the the sigma squareds are the lambda squareds, and 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 uh, that's right. And of course, if A is orthogonal, then what have I what I learn here? Well, I'm just back to my old argument. If A is a Q, then this is the identity, and I'm just getting the largest eigenvalue as one. Yeah. Sure. No, no. That's why I had to. Sigma max only agrees with uh, the sigmas. I'll take to be pi. This guy is. Oh, you remember him or her? Uh, is always or it? Uh, that's the one that's positive, definite. So its eigenvalues are truly positive. And then I'll take the positive square root and call it sigma. So your, your, your point is right on that, that uh, this is the, uh, it, it, I need that absolute value for exactly the reason you say. Right, let me write down a few matrices and you tell me their norm. What's the norm of this matrix? Minus three, zero, zero, one. Three, answer is three. And what, uh, what vector does it blow up by three? 
it multiply, if I multiply 1, 0, I get minus 3, 0, and it's three times as big, three times as long. The fact that it's negative isn't, doesn't change its length. Oh, I guess while we were here, well, so you see my formula would say if I really wanted to find the worst guy for this one, I should compute A transpose A. Would you want me to do that? Uh, probably not. Uh, I could compute A transpose A as some little two by two symmetric positive definite matrix. Yeah, well, heck, well, we could do that one. A transpose A, what will it have? I have to multiply on the left by one 10 down here. Is that right? So the top row is still 110. And I know it's going to be symmetric. And what do I have here? 101, maybe? Huh. So A transpose A. So what am I saying for the norm of this guy, of which I'm sort of regretting I ever wrote on the board? Uh, the norm of that matrix is what? What's our rule now to find the to find the worst x and the and the blow up size is look at a transpose a and find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors and it'll have an eigenvector around 101 uh, an eigenvalue around 101 but it won't be exactly 101 It'll be slightly more. You see, this matrix is slightly bigger than 101 because these little pieces will, it will bump it up a little. So that's why the, the eigenvalue, the largest eigenvalue of that one is a little bigger than 101 for sigma squared. And then when we take the square root, we have something a little bigger than that. OK. So you don't want to compute the norm exactly. I mean, that's hard work. You have to form A transpose A and find its eigenvalues. But we have a nice understanding now of how big a matrix is, how big a matrix is. And, and, it, and you see how A transpose A came into it. OK, now I'm ready for condition number now. We got norm. Ready for condition number. OK, so these were good properties of the norms. This is our, this is our uh, test case, which I now get to erase, never have to think of again. OK. OK, so what's condition number about? Condition number, I'm thinking we're solving a nice n by n system. But I'm thinking we might not know B exactly. I, I want to know, like, how nearly singular is A? If, I want to know how how hard is that problem to solve? It, it, if I, you know, if I'm using a, a 16 digits in in the calculations, what kind of accuracy can I expect in the answer? That's that would be that's the underlying question. It's, it's, it's a natural question. What kind of accuracy? How much uh, how much does uh, does elimination, see, if I do elimination, yeah, just think about it. If I do elimination, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm computing these multipliers, I'm, these ratios, I'm doing all these operations. And then if I'm only keeping 16 digits, I'm rounding them off. So if I have a matrix of order 100, then, you know, I'm doing like some fraction of a million operations. I'm rounding all those off. Is my answer junk? And that was a very serious question when it first became possible to do a million operations. If if it's junk, I mean we're we're lost, right? Uh, and uh, the question is how to understand how big could the error be there? If if you're solving not quite the right problem. And that's probably the right way to look at it, is that you, you want to solve AX equal B. And you actually solve some, some let, let's, let's say you actually solve A. You, you, you maybe you mess up. You, effectively, you, you change the problem to a B plus delta B. 
And so you actually find an x plus delta x. You get the wrong answer. I mean, this is your error. Because this is your error in the input. So do you see what I'm saying here? That, that there are just a zillion problems of this sort. This is the ideal system. So x is the ideal answer. But the real system, you're solving only a, a close, to, a nearby system, and then you get a nearby answer. And my question is, how big could that error be? I'd like to get a bound on delta x, a bound on, we want, we want a bound, we want delta x less than something. Uh, whoops, delta x. less than something. That will sort of tell us how hard the problem is to solve. Right? Now, a couple of points to make. You could say we're all, we might also not know A very well. Somebody's made that comment after an earlier lecture. We might, there ought to, we ought to maybe take into, into account a delta A, and the answer is true. So, so I could do what I'm doing now, also allowing a delta A, and that absolutely belongs there, because when we do these elimination steps, we're, we're making little mistakes in A. And on the right-hand side, we're making little mistakes in B. Let me make my life easy, just think about the right-hand side, but the left would be fine, too. So that's one point. Second point is, really, relative error is the right thing, that, that if I'm just estimating this, that really what I would like to know is the size of delta x compared to the size of x. Because I could change, if I just wanted delta x to be small or large, I could multiply b by a zillion, that would multiply x by a zillion, and then uh, it would totally make nonsense out of my error estimate. But if I look at the relative error, then multiplying b by a million won't change the relative error. So I would like this to be less than, so, and again on the right-hand side. So, so this is less than some, some multiple, and that's the question of the error in b, the relative error in b. Is that... I'm sorry that that's written so low down because that's the, that's the question. What's, what's the constant? How large could the relative error in x be if I know something about the relative error in b? Because this is like what I control by, by keeping more digits, and this is what comes out. So we're assuming that, that in the process of solving it, there were no errors made? No, we can, if we made errors in the process of solving it, we can say, okay, that's, that's part of delta B. So, so we're, we're assuming that we solved this guy exactly, but it was the wrong problem. So, so, uh, um, so I, I want to know if I solve the wrong problem, right, how different is that, relatively speaking, from solving the right problem right. Okay, and you see that somehow our little biz business of norms ought to help. Because what do we know about norms here and, and uh, so on? Let's, let's see if we can get some, you see, that this, is, this tells me how hard the problem is to solve. That's the size of that, that so that's gonna be the condition number. And I want to know, what is it in a typical problem? And actually, MATLAB will estimate it. If you, if you give MATLAB a linear system or give it, give, it, uh, yeah, give it this problem, it will estimate the condition number. It'll give you a signal. Hey, this, and, and if it's a wildly high condition number, the MATLAB will tell you so. Okay, so now let's just get and figure out what that C should be. Okay, so what can we say? So the true solution is x equal a inverse b, right? That's the true solution. So the, so the norm of x 
is less than what? The norm of A inverse times the norm of B. That's, so we're using norms here for A inverse. That's, that's okay. That's the definition of the norm. Somehow, what will it mean when the norm of A inverse is big? If A inverse is a big matrix, that sort of is telling us what? That's telling us that the matrix is nearly singular. Its inverse is giant. But I, I want to do things relatively. Because if I multiply by a million or divide by a million, I can make the inverse a million bigger or a million smaller without changing reality here. So it's, so it's relative that's reality. Okay, now I've got this equation. Now, can I, can I write this out as Ax and A delta X? Ax plus A delta X. Now, what, what should I do next? There, here's my true equation and here's my actual, uh, my uh, uh, numerical computational equation. So I've got those two. I just subtract that from that, right? So I learn that A delta X is delta B, right? So I have an idea now of how big delta B is. Delta B how, could, how big could delta B be now? Is, is. is. well, yeah, if from, if from this equation, so delta B is what I get by multiplying delta X by A. So our work on norms of the matrix says that this thing can't blow up by more than the norm of A. That's, so this, these facts are just come from these simple equations by the idea of what the norm means. Now, am I any better off? I have a feeling that if I just put these two pieces together, I'll get, I guess, what am I going to do? I'm going to divide one by the other to get something like that. Ooh, is that good? I don't know if that's so great. I don't think I've done it right. Why, why do I not think I've done it right? Because I want an inequality where delta x is less than something, and I have brilliantly come up with an inequality where it's larger than something. Uh, so, embarrassment here. Um, maybe what I wanted to do was have the inverse in this one. Yeah, that would have been a lot better. The inverse should have been in this one. And in this one, I shouldn't have taken the inverse. I should have just stayed where I was happy, AX equal B. That would have been better. All right, can, can I? Yes, on the videotape, we uh, can't, uh, we can't, uh, well, future viewers will forgive this. So this says that the length of B is less than the norm of A times the norm of X. That's good. Fine. And this one says that the size of delta X is less or equal to the size of A inverse times the size of delta B. Okay. Now we are getting somewhere. Now I have delta x less than or equal something, but I want relative error. I have to divide by x. So can I do that? What happens here? I start with this one, and I divide by delta by x. Okay. Now. Uh, X is bigger than B over the length of A. So if I divide by something smaller, right? This X is bigger than B over A. So if I divide instead by B over A, I've grown it more. So let me divide by B over A instead. Instead of dividing by this, 
I'll divide by B over A. Sneaks up in here. This is right. And I've seen, I now see what's the condition number. I now see what is this condition number. And, and do you see it, or have I, have I uh, uh, spoiled the blackboard? So it's, it should be here. It's, you see delta x over x, and here you see delta b over b, and here you see the condition number. The, the condition number is the norm of a, a inverse times the norm of a. Isn't that neat? Condition number is the norm of A inverse times the norm of A. That's the right quantity. Let's, I've, this has taken more time, and, but I still, having got this far, I would like to give it another little bit because I'm, uh, I'd like to understand what this means. Suppose A is an orthogonal matrix. What's its condition number? One. Because if, if it's an orthogonal matrix, its norm is one, and its inverse is also an orthogonal matrix, that's one. So the condition number is one. What's the condition number of this guy? A symmetric matrix. Well, tell me its norm and tell me its uh, tell me its inverse. So, for well, we can do its inverse easily. What's the inverse of this matrix? Minus a third, zero zero one. Okay. So, tell me the norms of those two guys. Three and one. Right. So the condition number is three. Exactly. Exactly. So. Uh, those those were easy because they were diagonal, but symmetric matrices are just as easy. For a symmetric matrix, so what's so so this is for a general matrix. If the matrix is symmetric, why don't I keep this keep this uh, list going? So this will then conclude the our table of norms and now condition numbers. Condition numbers, condition numbers. Okay, what's the, what are the condition numbers? If it's orthogonal, we said condition number was one. If now this is the case I'm interested in. If the if it's a symmetric matrix, because we do get a lot of those, what's what is the condition number? Remembering remembering our formula. You have to multiply the norm of A by the norm of A inverse. And we did a test case where we got a 3 and a 1. Anybody want to take a shot on this? There'll be a lamb, it'll be a ratio. Great, great, perfect. It'll be lambda max over lambda min. That tells you how hard the problem is. And you see the beauty of that number? If I multiply the matrix by 100, then I multiply both pieces by 100, same condition number. So, so you can't cheat by just uh, rescale. OK. And the answer here will be sigma max over sigma min, if we knew what these sigmas were. Well, we do know what they are. They're the eigenvalues of A transpose A. The sigmas are the eigenvalues of A transpose A. And when the matrix was symmetric, that was A squared, and we didn't have to, we didn't have to go up to that A squared level to, to get the answer. So, uh, so now I'm ready in these last minutes then to say something more about the um, singular value decomposition, which I had sort of intended to derive, but that's probably okay that we didn't. So let, now, now because these sigmas are, are the key to the sigma to the singular value decomposition. So let me end the lecture by writing down that decomposition and talking about what we learned from it. Okay. Okay. So the singular value decomposition says any a. 
m by n can be broken up into uh, an m by m orthogonal, I won't use q, so I'll use u, orthogonal. And over here, uh, an n by n orthogonal. And it's usually written V transpose, square orthogonal matrix. And in between comes diagonal. So in between will come a diagonal matrix, it's M by N, so it's, when I say diagonal, it's got these sigmas, these numbers, sigma 1, sigma 2, on the diagonal as, as far as they're non-zero, down to whatever, I, don't, I guess it'll stop at the rank of the matrix and the rest of the the rest of this guy will be zero so it really is diagonal that's the that's the uh, and it comes from a transpose a the it, it really totally linked to a transpose a the the eigenvalues the eigenvalues are are sigma 1 squared sigma 2 squared on to however many non-zero ones they are, and then maybe some zeros. Yeah. I, I should have said, in this condition number stuff, what if the matrix is singular? What will its condition number be in that case? So, so what would the, what do you figure? Would, would this number turn up, uh, uh, explode to? If the matrix A is singular. singular, it'll be infinite. Yeah, it won't be defined, but basically it'll be infinite. Yeah. So a, a really singular matrix is totally ill-conditioned. And but uh, uh, somehow we don't worry so much about those. It's the ones that are nearly singular that are extremely ill-conditioned, but we have to deal with them. Those are the ones that we have to work with. And actually, uh, it, right, if it was totally, if it was singular, you'd say you'd, you'd give up on AX equal B and go to least squares. But what do you do if it's almost singular? Do you give up on the thing and go to least squares? Well, here's what you do if you know the singular value decomposition. If the thing is nearly singular, some of these or maybe the last one or the last couple will be extremely small and you're better off to wipe them out completely so so that's one way of kind of um, well, I don't know regularizing the problem or dealing with it is is uh, is to uh, move to a to a singular matrix move to the nearest singular matrix and and, and accept the thing as singular instead of being on the knife edge of singularity, but but trying to deal with it as if it's not singular. Could you think about, I'll take a look at, could you stand right next to that, pic, that, that little formula you got left over from the first part? From here? This formula? Right. Now we're looking, it's sort of like you're throwing out the directions where you keep that maximum. Yeah, you are. I'm going to throw out those directions and I'm going to keep all my good ones. Uh, 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 let's see. Uh, when, I, when I take this formula, I'm certainly throwing out directions. And, and in, in this case, I'm throwing out the U and the V, and I'm looking at the sigmas. That's, but this, but I'm gonna, when I zero out some of those sigmas, it's like I'm, gonna, I'm not going to take my back. I'm gonna, uh, that's right. I, I, exactly. So if I'm going to zero out some sigmas, that means I'm going to look for the best answer in some subspace where the darn problem is well conditioned. I mean, I guess, boy, we're touching on a world here of, ill-conditioned problems. What do you do when the problem is just lousy and still you have to solve it? And, and it's going to happen in problems at the lab. It's going to happen in problems everywhere. Typical, so can I like make a short speech about ill-conditioned problems? Uh, typical ill-conditioned problems are co uh, so-called inverse problems. So in, uh, suppose I... Um, you know the direct problem is I give some boundary conditions, I give some, I give an equation, and I get a, I, I discover what the field looks like. 
inverse problems are, I don't know what that system really is. All I know is some outputs and some inputs, and I'm trying to figure out what's, what's in that black box. And those, that, so that's called the inverse problem. The direct problem would be know what's in the black box and solve AX equal B, best you can. Inverse problems come when you might know some X's and some B's and you're thinking, well, what, you know, what's, what's, what's the system about? And that's extremely difficult to, so that'll be a very um, ill-conditioned problem in general. Um, and uh, so there are books written about inverse problems. And, you know, they, they uh, are going to come up. You could, you could create a scenario, I, I'm sure, better than I, in which it's an inverse problem that you really want to solve. You, you have some... You, you know, you have some sensor data, and you're trying to figure out, well, okay, what produced it? Uh, maybe this is a topic which you could email me about and I could uh, 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 develop further. Um, okay, so th that's, that's ill conditioning, and that's the uh, sort of the nearest, the nearest singular matrix happens when we set this thing to zero. Let's suppose we're talking square matrices here. So this is really a, a proper diagonal matrix. The nearest singular one would be, that, that's, that measures how far it is from singular. And if we want to go to singular, we make that, that thing zero. So these sigmas are the, sort of they're the right numbers to look at. They, they match the eigenvalues in, in, for nice matrices, but we've seen for that, one ten zero one matrix that the eigenvalues didn't give a picture, and the singular values do. Uh, maybe one other nearest problem occurs to me that, that might be relevant. So this I'll just describe the problem. Suppose I'm changing coordinate systems. So I have a I have a like an Earth-based system in which I'm doing measurements. And then I have uh, a uh, space-based system in which I'm doing measurements. And I would like to convert, but I don't maybe know. Um, maybe I, okay, maybe here's a way to say it. Suppose I'm measuring the same thing. So I, I, know, I know what it looks like in the Earth-based system, and I know what it looks like in the space-based system. And what I'm trying to figure out is, what was the rotation of coordinates that connected those two systems? Shall I, shall I describe that problem again? Just, just as a, so I'm, 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 I'm hunting for the rotation now. I, I'm given vectors, the same vector, you know, with its coordinates in one system and its coordinates in a second system, and I'm wondering, Okay, how are those systems connected? How, if, if, so I'm given like, I probably better be given three vectors. And so, like, I, of course, I'll put them in a little matrix. So I'm given a three by three matrix, three vectors, Earth based. And I'm given three vectors, the same three vectors, space based. And I know that if I did the measurements exactly, there's some rotation, and of course, I'm going to call that thing Q, so that these, those go to that. But if I didn't do them exactly, I mean, I could see, since that's supposed to be an orthogonal matrix, if this inverse times that isn't orthogonal, then I didn't do them exactly, which I probably didn't. So what's the best Q? That's, the, that's the, another kind of problem that this singular value decomposition solves. Um, you see what that question was? I, I, I'm happy to get email about it and, and return to it, but let me say, say what's the answer. The answer will lie in the U and the V. For, for our previous question, the answer lay in the sigmas, but now we're looking for, a, for an orthogonal matrix, and somewhere in the U and the V is that. Um, so it's, I would take the inverse of that times that. That should be orthogonal if I was doing it perfectly. 
I would do its SVD, and the U and the V there would give me the best Q. So th this is the kind of question that the singular value decomposition is just perfect for. It measures the size of matrices. It finds the nearest singular matrix, the nearest orthogonal matrix, uh, all these uh, sort of optimization with matrix questions. OK, so that's the SVD. Um, sort of maybe I could say put to use rather than um, proved. I didn't uh, prove this. This It's interesting that the people who found this factorization, it goes back to the 1870s, approximately, about 1870. But uh, somehow for, for many, many years, it wasn't recognized how important that was. Uh, and uh, but now it now it's increasingly recognized as as the the key factorization which actually allows you to get lots of others. Okay for today. All right. Thanks. Uh,